I've done a few videos on how cable TV works in broad strokes. So I thought I'd bring it back down to home and what you actually connect to, what your wire actually connects to at the pole or the pedestal if you're underground cable TV. First of all, the wire that you connect with, coax, doesn't like to have any bends or kinks or any kind of... Th it's a transmission line, which I've discussed elsewhere. You don't want any kind of thing cause a reflection in the transmission line. A kink will cause a reflection. So there's a minimum radius that you're supposed to use when you put cable in and install cable. That's why you see loops and stuff instead of you don't see right angle turns. It's basically like a capacitor, you know, you've got a dielectric a center conductor and an outer shield and capacitant you know you have to have it shielded you have to shield the center conductor to transmit your signal you have to shield it from all the outside radio signals it has to be totally shielded so there's going to be capacitance and the way they overcome that capacitance is by running at a low impedance you know 75 ohms real typical for uh pretty much universal for distribution uh maybe a little 300 still going around TV land, you know, for a home antenna land, but pretty much 75 ohm is the rule for most RF distribution. Now 50 ohm is still used for transmission, and the cables are characterized a little bit differently. The spacing, the capacitance per foot, and the size of the dielectric and all that. Still, it's the same thing though. It's a transmission line, can't be kinked, you can't get water in the connectors, you can't let the connectors corrode, all that obvious stuff. And I've discussed some of those problems in previous videos. Anyway, the unit you hook up to at the pole or in your pedestal is called a tap. And this is an example of one. This is kind of atypical. Normally, they go left to right for in to out. These are the one brand in the world that go the other way. But most brands will go left to right, in and out, as you look at the tap, as if it was mounted in a pedestal. It'll always be in to out. And I'll get into more on this tap, too, because this is a special tap, more modern tap than the old days. Now, the taps have a, a number on them. So this one's got a 4 on it. This is a 4 tap with two ports. This is a 4 two-way. A uh, tap you might have at your pole, maybe it's a 20 four-way. Feeds four different neighbors, you know, you and three other neighbors, possibly. What's inside of this tap, though, and it's got an input and an output, you know, it feeds down the cable to the next pole. And they start out like a 23 tap. You know, the first pole coming out of an amplifier might be a 23. Some systems it's a 26. Some systems will start at a 20. All depends how they're running their amplifiers. But 23 is real typical. Maybe the first tap's a 23, second tap's a 20, then the neighbor down will be a 17. Then they may have to skip one because the cable's too long or something. Maybe they'll go to skip to an 11. And maybe they'll skip all the way down to a 4 if it's a long reach to the 4. So it kind of depends on the footage uh, between the taps too. But basically you got a cascade of taps. You know, your first one, second one, third one, boom, boom, boom. If there's eight ports, you can only go down to an 11 because an eight-way 11 tap, if you look at this eight-way tap, and you look at the ports, it'll say 11 dB on each port. That means it's 11 dB down from the input. You look at a, a three-way splitter, and um, you'll see the ports are uneven. The one leg is 7 dB down, the other two are 3.5 down. That's because this is really a two-way splitter, and then a second two-way hanging from the two-way. So it's like this is off the first, this is like a two-way splitter, and they've taken the one leg and put another two-way splitter on the end of it. So 3.5 plus 3.5 makes 7 dB. So you lose a lot of power whenever you split. And here's a two-way splitter, 3.5 dB per split. And even though dBmV is uh, related to voltage, a reference to voltage I should say, you're almost dealing with power because you've got such a low impedance going. Got a low constant impedance of 75 ohms. So yeah, when you split, you're gonna split power-wise. You're gonna lose three and a half dB per port. You know, three dB is the theoretical, and three and a half is what you end up with a little bit of loss beyond the uh, actual split. One two-way, feeding two more two-ways, feeding the ports. So you know, 3.5 plus 3.5 adds up. Now, the number that I was getting back to where I was going here. The number on the tap might be a 23, it might be a 4, you know, it might be anything in between. It shouldn't be that big of a concern for the customer, although you will get a little different service. This guy has got different issues than this guy has. This guy at the 23 may have trouble if he has a whole lot of splits in the house. and He's really splitting a signal, splitting a signal, splitting a signal. He may end up with uh, kind of a low return on uh, different items like his 
modem and his cable TV box that need to talk back to the system. He could be challenged with low return if he's got a whole lot of splitters in his house and a messy rat's nest of cable wiring that he did himself. On the other hand, the guy down here, he's only 4 dB off the line. So if you're going down along cascaded taps, this tap takes a smaller bite out of the signal than this tap. This tap at the end takes the whole signal. It, it has no output at all, it just ends. It's just basically a splitter. This 4 is actually, you know, we told you 3.5 per port. This 4 tap is just a 3.5 dB, you know, two-way splitter. It has no output. It has an output port, just because they all do. But here's an example of one. You know, they're both capped. There's nothing, no connector because there's nothing out of this. All the input goes to the two ports. It's just a splitter, just like that is in a fancier case. Although this one's got an equalizer in it, and that's something I'm getting around to discussing. And this is the complicated thing about it. The guy at the four is going to have a lot more return available to him um, and how to put this. So if your modem is transmitting at 50, and it's got to get through some splitters at your house and the loss of your cable line and everything else. So let's say your modem is transmitting 50, but it's got to go through this 23 tap, add that, you know, take that from the 50. It's got to go through all the passes in your house. What happens is your modem will send as much signal as it needs. It kind of maxes out around 50 though. But anyway, they can only go so high, then they max out. If the modem's maxed out and you got a real high tap value, maybe you're not going to make it. Or maybe the noise, you know, if you're not getting your full level back to the office, maybe the noise will get you a little bit. But on this low tap, what, what happens is your modem has to turn itself down. It's not able to transmit at that 50 or that 46. We really like it to transmit around 46, 43, 46. Real good middle of the road cherry for these modems to transmit at. You, you took them down too far, you have them transmitting down in the 20s, then the signal noise ratio of the modem itself is poor, poorer, and um, all the noise from the neighbors and everything else, and loose connections in your house, everything else, if you're only transmitting at a 20, it makes it a lot easier for that other stuff to come in. If I'm over here and I'm transmitting at a 50 into this tap to get back to the system, I'm a little more robust. It takes a lot of interference to compete with that 50. If I'm back down here at the end of the line and I'm only transmitting 20 into the tap, then a lot of stuff can get in there. You know, it can compete with that 20 a lot more than it could compete with that 50. Broad strokes here, of course. But I hope I'm conveying that. The, uh, we want your modem to work harder than it is going to have to work at the end of the line. So you've got an advantage being at the end of the line in that you can have a lot of splits in your house and it'll still work. But anything gets loose in your house and you'll probably have a cable man showing up at your door, tired, because he's spent the last six hours finding your, finding your loose, noisy w wiring in your house. And he'll come to your door and he'll want to come in because he wants to tighten up your wiring and you should let them because they'll fix your wiring up for free or at least get something ordered for you to get done. The guy at the end of the line in the four here only has to transmit a little bit of signal to get back well he only needs to get a little bit of interference to black out the whole system. So the guy at the end of the line is kind of uh, vulnerable to noise. It's real easy for him to cause trouble if everything in his house isn't perfect. Nice and tight and perfect. To mitigate that in more modern systems they've started putting in equalizers. And I was working in a real old system and I was splicing these in like hot candy all over the place. I was going to the end of lines wherever I had high transmits, or low transmits I should say, out of modems. I could see what the transmit levels were on the computer. Find a pocket of low transmits and I'd go and I'd change the taps out. And I'd put newer taps in that have a new feature. Not this model tap, we used a, a nicer tap actually. But they have a little plug-in and you unplug the plastic thing that was here just a blue one or whatever. It's just a straight through bypass board and you plug in one that has a number on it. This is a 9 dB equalizer and there's different types of equalizers and filters and band stops and stuff you can get for them. But I was trying to get the guys to use the equalizers not just the ones that you know that just drop the uh, return only and don't affect the low end. You really want to get the low end down too. You want to equalize it nice. You don't want extra energy going to the customer's drop that they can't use on the low end. It really doesn't help anything. I'm getting into the weeds now though. So that's what's new about cable taps. And it's a big deal because without these equalizers and the low value taps, the system's very vulnerable to a customer having a real noisy line in his house. And very typically it's a loose wire in the house and uh, often right at the modem itself. And maybe the guy's got some kind of source of interference like real famous are metal halide light bulbs for groves. Those are uh, a real classic. 
but any kind of motor or anything else that causes interference can be an issue. I'm shooting this all at 4K, so you can probably zoom in and read anything here. I'm actually trying to test out this memory chip I got in the camera. So I talked about the taps. I talked about the wire and how it's one wire is in shield. I started talking about the importance of shielding, and any loose connection is going to make your cable turn into an antenna, let signal into the system, pollute your return, and really cause you a bad day. RG6, this is like a sample of what RG6 looks like. This is the cable that's mostly used these days, RG6, for around the house and even to the house. The wire coming to your house will have a messenger on it, so it'll be this wire plus a wire molded onto it. It's just a strength member uh, to support the wire. The quality of cable varies greatly. Uh, there's also a size smaller than this called 59. That's almost out of use nowadays. Uh, it can be used indoors though. It just has more loss per foot. It's pretty much extinct. But the quality of the cable is very key. Um, Builder Square was selling some cable that had an off-center center conductor. Uh, obviously that didn't work too well. A lot of people weird their houses with it. It was really, really bad stuff. Caused a lot of work. So you're best off getting the cable from the cable company. You're best off getting your splitters from the cable company so you don't get junk. Your cable company will see something like this and they'll just like puke all over you saying, oh, that's got to be crap. Because so many splitters cause them so much, so much trouble that cable companies only have a few splitters that are approved in their system to be used. The other thing I wanted to point out briefly is not everything that looks like a splitter is a splitter. This is a directional coupler, which is kind of what I was drawing in this other thing here. Or I showed you a 20 tab, it's actually a DC-13 directional coupler 13 in a four-way combined. So say if you had a DC-9 and a four-way, well there's 7 dB per port here, plus 9. So this is a 7 plus 9 would be a 16, or they'd call it a 17 value tap. So this is what would be inside of a 17 value tap, electronically anyway. So, yeah, not everything that looks like a two-way is a two-way. This is a uh, power inserter for feeding an amplifier. You try to use this for a two-way, it's not going to work. There's also TVFM splitters, directional couplers like I showed you. A whole variety of things that you could have here. There's uh, splitters made for a satellite that won't work, you know, very well on cable TV or won't work at all, depending on the frequency ranges involved. The thing about these DCs is a DC-13, a DC-17, you know, whatever the value ends up being, the higher the value on the DC, the less of a bite it takes out of the main line. And the lower this value is, the bigger bite it takes out of the main line. You get further down the line, the bigger bite each tap has to take out of the signal. You can run two 23s in a row if the wire between the pole, you know, between pole to pole, the wire isn't too long. A lot of times you can go 23, 20, or 23, 23, 20, you know, you can double up some of these high value taps because they don't take a very big bite out of the signal. When you get down here, sometimes you got to eliminate one of the sequence. You may go like 14, you may have to skip down to an 8, you know, just, you may have to skip some of these values on your way down towards the end. Because each one of these taps takes a bigger and bigger bite, where finally the last tap value takes the whole bite, and there's nothing on the output after that tap. So, connectors, I was talking about shielding and cable. Connectors are key. Modern connectors are crimped on compression type connectors like this. Uh, the cable has to be stripped right and everything else. You really need to buy the crimper that belongs to the connectors you're going to use. If you're going to go to a store and buy connectors, buy the crimper that's made for those connectors. The next thing I wanted to get into the molded on connectors. Sometimes these pre made connectors, pre made cables like you got from Radio Shack that have a molded on end. Those were notoriously poor. The ones with the molded on 90 degree end just were horrible. And the first time they pulled out wrong, the uh, shield breaks on one end and uh, they leak like crazy. Those are real notorious problems. So if they got molded on ends, they're very suspect. And you probably should avoid even using such things. Grounding, I'll talk about real quickly. Uh, I had a ground block out here, but I lost it. Any of these splitters, though, you see they've got grounding built into them. Most of them are missing their screws. These are old ones that have been hanging around. But they got a screw and a little grounding port on them, so they can act as a ground block. A plain ground block is just like a, this is a what they call a barrel, just joins two cables together. A ground block looks just like this, but it's got a metal strap that it's attached to. It's all one cast thing, usually, and a little ground attachment onto it. I showed you in my earlier picture, you'll see one. Uh, at the beginning of this video. 
when I showed you the outside of my house. I got two ground blocks together. And the point I want to make about ground blocks is make sure your ground block is not grounded inside. In other words, the ground wire can attach on the inside and run outside to the ground block. The ground block itself should not be inside the house. The first point of grounding should be outside the house. And that's because if you ever lose your neutral, your cable wire can uh, start smoking and even go into flames in a severe case. So because of that hazard, you know, if your house possibly losing its neutral at some point, um, yeah, never, never put your ground block deep inside the house. And I learned that the hard way. I saw this lady, not from my work, but from customers, was like, my cable's in fire, my cable's in fire. I ran in there and uh, her ground block was in her laundry room right by her dryer uh, vent. Her dryer vent had that paper, that really flammable, dangerous, you know, flexible dryer vent stuff. And the cable had been, was smoking and burning because the ground block was sitting right there by that vent. She started her uh, vent hose on, on fire. Anyway, so ground block should stay outside and think about what you're doing grounding wise. Everything has to be tight. Can't have anything loose. Like I said, the worst offender is right at the modem. People have it, you know, just barely on the modem loose. You know, that causes big trouble. Especially since a lot of modems have routers built into them now, and you just get a ton of interference back from the modem just from having the cable on loose. And if you've got the cable on loose and you live on one of these end of line taps, you're probably going to have an irritated cable employee hunting you down to try to tighten your stuff up. So save them the trouble and keep it tight yourself. As far as house amps go, you really should leave it to your cable company. Especially in these days of two-way cable where you've got a return to wor worry about. The new modern house amps have, this has got a passive return. So there's a certain loss in the return. Now there's a one confusing little point. There's an old term called return loss. And that's actually a loss of reflection. It's not a loss of the return path in an amplifier like this. They have to spec they put that in different wording. Return loss is different. Return loss is the reflection like say off the input to this cable, my input into this amp, the return loss would be the signal reflected back at me. That's the return loss, not the return loss of the amplifier. This amplifier's got a passive return path back. So that's a little confusing. You gotta know what you're looking at when you hear the term return loss. It doesn't necessarily mean the loss of your return path. You have to ferret that out because it's an old term and return loss used to mean and still does mean reflection. So, yeah, it's a little confusing. This is a connector for that fatter cable called 11, which is still in use. And this is for 6. And there's a small, a slightly smaller size for 59. Well, I hope this helped anybody. Feedback. And if you want me to talk about antennas, I might go there too. So why is it that I've got so much return off this low end here? Obviously, they're dropping these taps down in value because the signal's dropping along with, you know, the signal's dropping, dropping, dropping. Um, why wouldn't my return drop too? Well, the return is sent at a real low frequency. And as I discussed in earlier videos, the higher frequency drops a lot faster than the low frequency does. This return being sent at a real low frequency, it doesn't have the loss that the high end does. So while your high end is, and these taps, this cascade, downward cascade of hotter and hotter values, you know, closer and closer to the line. This is 23 dB from the line value, where this is only 4 dB down from the cable line. So the reason is the cable line has loss. The taps each have a loss. And the loss is all calculated for the very high end, because that's where your loss is the highest. But return being sent at a real low end, a real low frequency, doesn't have as much loss. That's why your return ends up really sky high at the end. You're practically no loss in the, well not no loss, but very low loss in the return compared to the very high end of your cable system, which might be, you know, typically 750 megahertz or even up to a gig nowadays. So I thought I'd make that little clarification of why your return ends up so strong on a four tap, unless you got an equalizer into it.